I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry, brought to you by Deakin University, home to the world's number one sports science school. My name is Ruben Williams. I'm an ex-Cricket Australia employee who started Sports Grad to help others get their dream job in sport. And uh, now it's become my own dream job. I, uh, I love helping people with their careers. And if you are looking to get into sport, then this podcast is a perfect place to begin. Now, if we're not already, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn or Instagram. Feel free to reach out there if you've got any questions or if you just want to say hi. And uh, if you're new to the show, well, each week I learn how people made it in the sports industry. I'll tease out their career decisions, some of their work habits, skills, everything they do that makes them great so that you can learn how do you get into sport, how do you get promoted once you are in the industry, and how do you just generally have a thriving career within the sports industry. Now, there's a lot going on at Sports Grad, a lot of jobs, a lot of podcasts, a lot of events. And if you want to stay up to date with absolutely everything that's going on in the world of Sports Grad, make sure you are subscribed to the Sports Grad newsletter. If you want to jump on that, head to www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter and you can grab it there or head to the link in the show notes and you can uh, grab it there as well. Now, as always, uh, a quick shout out to the Sports Grad community. I've actually just come from having coffee with our Melbourne members this morning. So every Friday morning, our members in Melbourne will gather at uh, usually Cheeky Monkey Cafe in Richmond on Swan Street. And um, we gathered there this morning at about 7.30. So I've just come straight from there to recording this podcast. And uh, it was the first time that I've been at Coffee Club in about 10 weeks or so. And uh, it was just absolutely awesome to to see everybody again and to um and to uh, hear what everyone's been up to and see their wins and hear how their career is progressing and just kind of and also just observe the conversations going on because a lot of people have brought to the table their own situation, their own challenges that they're facing, and, and at Coffee Club, it's a perfect time for members to kind of chat with each other and give each other advice or encouragement and also like it's just a lot of members inspiring other members to go on and do really cool things. So. Really happy to be back in Melbourne, really happy to get along to that and to um, get amongst the community again. So um, great to see all those people this morning. If I didn't catch you then, as always, we've got online events coming up. So if you are a pro member, I believe we have a speed networking session happening tonight. And uh, if you're a rookie member, we've got another one coming up next week. But as always, there's plenty of Q&As with industry professionals to get involved with, masterclasses as well. So um, members, look out at the... uh, the discord for everything that's coming up there as well have you got your eye on a future in sport if you're ready to transform the industry then perhaps get ready to study with deacon and prepare yourself to redefine what it means to work in sport that's what i did at least deacon school of exercise and nutrition sciences is ranked number one in the world pretty cool hey so if you want to turn your passion for sport into an impactful career get ready to push the limits of exercise science sport coaching sport development sport management nutrition sciences physical education and more you can do it all at deacon apply now now and study at Deakin University. Now, I mentioned it's, this is my first coffee club back. Bear with me this episode because I have just returned to Melbourne. I was on a flight from London that landed on midnight on Tuesday. I didn't sleep at all on Tuesday going into Wednesday. And then the last couple of mornings I've been up since about you know 3, 4 a.m. This morning on Friday that we're recording this, I think I've been up since about 2.30 a.m., uh, today. So um, I am running on coffee and uh, a whole lot of jet lag at the moment. So I will attempt to make this as comprehensible as, as possible, but I, um, I'm making no guarantees. So uh, bear with me for this. But um, I'm super excited to, to share this with you. So this is going to be a recount of um, what made my Paris experience. Now, for context, I was there for about two and a half weeks. I tried to be there for the entire length of the Olympics. So I arrived the day before the opening ceremony and and left the day of the closing ceremony and um, was there just to try and take in absolutely everything that the Olympics has to offer. So 
the purpose of this recount is to really give you guys an insight as to what it was like to be in Paris on the ground, hopefully encourage you to get to an Olympics at some point in your life, whether you're just attending as a fan or you want to volunteer or you want to work as well. If you want to work at the Olympics, I'd particularly encourage you to go back to episodes and listen to the episode I did talking to seven people who are working on the ground in, in various roles to get an understanding of what they do and um, and what their role at the Paris Olympics was. But then lastly, selfishly, this episode is almost a bit of a reminder to myself so that when the next major event rolls around, I can kind of reflect on how I went about squeezing the most out of Paris and attempt to do that for the next one. So I reckon when LA 2028 is about to hit, I'll probably come back and listen to this and be like, okay, Ruben, you need to do these things if you want to have a good time. That's the kind of the purpose of this. Now, a couple of other bits of context as well. Um, I have been very lucky to get a lot to a lot of sport in the last 24 months or so and um, have been and so a lot of my sort of reflections on this Olympics comes from you know comparing it to other events I've been to so for example in 2022 I went to the FIFA World Cup in Qatar 2018 I was at the FIFA World Cup in in 28 in, in Russia uh, I went to the Cricket World Cup in uh, in India last year I was at the Ashes at Lords last year. Uh, went to a couple of European football matches in in Portugal and more recently went to the Premier League in London before flying home. And so now I kind of feel like I'm at a point where I've been to a lot of international sport and can kind of understand what's good and what's not good. And so I hope this reflection, you know, um, the purpose of this is to try and take all of that into account and to try and help you guys see like, Yes, the Olympics is an amazing thing. Paris is an incredible city, but actually how does it stack up to the array of events that are out there in world sport? So um, that is the uh, the point of view that this is coming from. Now, um, about a couple of weeks before I arrived in London, uh, sorry, before I arrived in Paris, I was um, I was sitting in London having a coffee with a friend and they asked me, Ruben, what, what have you got planned? And at that point in time, I had nothing planned. <laughs> I, I said, my plan is to um, do a couple of things. One, I'm going to jump on some tickets quickly to make sure I can see some sport. But my other plan is to try and meet as many people as possible and bring a lot of people who I know, gonna, know are going to be there together. And the way I planned to do that was through a group chat. And so I, I set up this group chat called Aussies in Sport in Paris uh, just to kind of connect a whole lot of people who I knew were going to be there. A lot of them included past podcast guests or, or friends of friends. And and so I kind of, you know, I saw a lot of people on LinkedIn who were saying, hey, I'm going over to Paris soon. So I'd message them and be like, hey, why don't you jump in this group group chat? And then they would send it to their friends. And so it started to kind of gather momentum and we ended up with this pool of people on a WhatsApp group. So that was kind of like um, the only real thing I had planned. The other intention I had was literally just hang around for the entire tournament and just see what happens. And the reason for that is because there is always something going on at these events. There's always someone in town that you didn't know about. And that opens you up to new opportunities. For example, last year when I was in London, um, didn't just drop in and out for the ashes, stayed there for about two weeks to see what would be going on and um, end up getting connected with a guy who works at the English cricket board who after having a coffee with him, he then says, We've got a little mini conference happening tomorrow afternoon. It's going to include people who work in participation across the NBA, the NFL, the Premier League. They're all going to be in London at this point in time. Do you want to come along to that? And just by being in town, it opened me up to those opportunities and to meet some of those people. And now I'm still in touch with some of those people today. Ironically, um, it actually gave me a chance to meet a bunch of people who had made the trip all the way from from Melbourne, um, who, you know, somehow you don't bump into them in your own city, but when you're on the other side of the world, that proves to be a better opportunity. So my goal was just hang around and see what happens with Paris because you just never know what's going to come up. And so with all that in mind, I'm going to share with you the, the three things that really shaped my experience. And there are plenty of stories to share that go alongside these three key things. And then I'm also going to share with you what I would plan to do for LA 28 or any other major event, knowing what I know now. How would this experience shape what I do at the next event? And so, um, so my hope is that if you're ever thinking about working on the Olympics or attending it, that these stories... Um, you know, convince you to pursue that pretty hard because the, uh, you know, 
it makes a lot of sense, but the Olympics are pretty special. But once you experience, you are, you never want to miss another one. And um, I certainly felt that with the FIFA World Cup, and now I've definitely felt that with the Olympics. So the number one thing that kind of shaped my experience in Paris was that the Olympic spirit is a very real thing. And this really became apparent through the whole vibe just around town. The, like the Olympic spirit and the attitudes and the positive nature of everyone in town was really like the highlight of, of being in Paris. And, you know, this is kind of a culmination of a lot of different things. You obviously got the best athletes in the world descending on one point to kind of, you know, prove who's the best at all these different physical pursuits and you know when you think back to like what it's taken every single one of these athletes over four eight twelve years um, of training to get to this point and put their best performance on the world stage it really is such like a special thing just to kind of think about when you are literally staring at a track cyclist looking at the size of their quads thinking like my god how many squats how many box jumps how many training sessions did you have to go through just to be on this velodrome in front of me just for my entertainment but also for your ability to prove that you are the best in the world like it is it is just such a a cool thing to be sitting in front of you so you've got the best athletes all over the world you've also got people from all over the world coming and descending on one spot as well and when I was in Qatar for the FIFA World Cup, that was one thing that I really noticed that improved the experience of being in Qatar versus in Russia because in Russia at the World Cup, we would go out to Kazan to see Australia play France and you go out at night or during the day and the only people around town are French people and Australians. And then if you happen to stay longer than the game, then you know eventually you would get the two teams or the fans of the two teams rolling in next coming in so you know we'd had spain and, and moroccan fans descend upon town but doha had pretty much every single game of the last world cup and that made me think maybe this is what an olympics is going to be like and that's exactly what it was like and so having all these people who share the same thing in common a love for sport and a want to see the best people in the world compete and a love for events and a major spectacle really made it such an incredible experience and then particularly with you know Everything that goes in is all promoting the Olympic movement to, you know, to be healthy, to be active, to be kind to one another. All these different things that the IOC promotes as a values-based organization was just awesome. And so it really kind of came together as what felt like the greatest conference on earth um, and this real celebration of humanity, which which was just incredible to be a part of. Like aside from any one event like the whole vibe of it together was really the the highlight of it and what shaped everything you did. But in saying that, I did get to a lot of events. Um, I couldn't believe how many actually I went to when counting back. So I managed to see 16 sports, which were a combination of sourcing my own tickets. So this is a, <laughs> when I when I caught up with the, the person in London and said, you know, I have no plans. And then I caught up with them when I went back to London and, you know, said I went to 16 sports. They were like, wow, you really got that together quickly. <laughs> um, but kind of sourced tickets through a combination of the resale site, buying them straight from the Paris website itself. Um, and then again, just being around town and knowing the right people opened up a lot of doors to a lot of events as well. But there were also a lot of free events too, which um, were arguably the best events in terms of atmosphere because they brought the most people and they brought a lot of the French people as well. So so just to reel them off, I saw the rowing, I saw the road cycling time trial, I saw the water polo, boxing, rugby sevens, triathlon, canoe slalom with Jess Fox who won the gold medal, which was incredible. Golf, that was knowing how terrible I am at golf and seeing these guys up person was probably the sport that I was most impressed by. <laughs> um, these guys were just like landing them on greens and I'm like, I, I could never hit a ball like that. So that was really cool to see in person for the first time. The athletics, that was amazing. Being there to witness a 100-meter final has been a bucket list item of mine for about a decade. And um, the hype around that and the build-up to it was just absolutely amazing. The beach volleyball, that was probably the main spectacle that everyone talked about, beach volleyball under the Eiffel Tower. Um, I thought I wasn't going to be able to see that, but then thankfully a, a friend came through with a ticket at the last minute. So I was very grateful to them to be able to experience that. The uh, the road cycling race, I absolutely love this. I uh, Those people who know me know I'm a massive fan of the Tour de France. I reckon it's one of the best spectator events you can get to in the world. And so to 
get that same sort of vibe within Paris was was really, really cool to see. I thought I'd be quite clever and try and go to the top of the hill climb in Montmartre to, um, you know, see where they're going at their slowest, see where the pack can break up and you hopefully get a lot of riders kind of dribbling through, which is what I've done on many a hill climb finish before at the um, five stages of the Tour de France as I've seen in the past. But none of those stages were surrounded by a city. So when we went to try and see the the road cycling, it was just jam-packed with people trying to fit into these skinny streets in in Paris. But um, that was a really cool event to, to be a part of. Something that was brand new to me, wrestling, the Roman Greco wrestling. And um, seeing this, like this is one event where clearly like everyone here is just along to experience something new. There are a couple of passionate fans, a couple of OG Roman Greco people out there, but for the most part, it felt like everyone was there just to kind of experience something new. And, um, and so we watched this guy from Cuba who's literally 41 or 42 years old in like the, the heat rounds before he went on to win his fifth consecutive gold medal. He's, he is the first person in the history of the Olympics to win five consecutive gold medals in the same event, which I just thought was absolutely incredible. So that was a real cool spectacle to, to see as well. Track cycling, that was amazing. Seeing these bikes up close, seeing the angle of the velodrome is just insane and watching them whiz past your face as well was was amazing. Basketball, got to see the Opals play USA in a – in, uh, in a semi-final match and um, that had a pretty typical sort of basketball atmosphere which is very entertaining, very fun. And um, But the thing that made this really cool was, was literally the fact that the USA were playing because they bring so much star power to their, their events. So, you know, sitting courtside of, of, the, of the match was, you know, Kevin Durant and a few others from the USA Dream Team. You then had uh, Megan Rapinoe, who is an absolute legend of women's football, also just sitting down there. And then after the game, you know, Lauren Jackson wanders over, gets a selfie with Megan, and and you can see there's a couple of goats who are just friends from being good at sport, which is which was really cool to see. So the USA really brought the uh, the star power and um and the energy to that basketball game. The marathon, this was amazing personally because one of my goals having got quite into my running over the last couple of years um, was to just run alongside them. I just wanted to run with that lead pack with Kipchoge and the other runners in there and just to see how long I could keep up with them. And so um, so I woke up early one morning, ventured out to a spot near the Eiffel Tower and found a stretch of road that I could run alongside them for and to see how fast I go and how long I could keep up with them. And um, – some of you might have seen this online. <laughs> I put together a little TikTok, which uh, somehow is up to 1.9 million views of uh, me giving a comparison to the pros on how fast I can run and for how long with them. And um, I'll give you a spoiler. I lasted about 500 meters running at about three minutes per kilometer pace. And uh, that's all I can manage. And um, I'll tell you a bit more about it later, but I eventually ran the full marathon course and um you know these guys running in two hours and six minutes i think was the winner for the men's and uh i ran the whole thing in four hours and 22 so <laughs> these guys are just insane but the the marathon and again with the triathlon those events felt so, like they were some of the more exciting events because you could have so many people turn out for them and you know anytime a french runner went past or a french triathlete went past just the crowd would go would go insane. So that was um, that was a real highlight. Some of these free events, and then finally the uh, the modern pentathlon. Modern pentathlon. I've never seen this before, but I, I wanted to get out to it just to kind of see what the hell is this sport. But also one of the real perks about the also one of the real um, awesome things about the Paris Olympics was the venues that they were hosting all these different events at. And one venue I was desperate to see was the Palace of Versailles that was hosting the Equestrian. Now, tickets to the Equestrian were extremely hard to come by and exorbitantly priced. And so my workaround to this was to go to the modern pentathlon because there is a an Equestrian leg of that an event. And so when I was looking up tickets to that, the final weekend of events had plenty of available for a pretty cheap price. And so I rock up there and they've got the Equestrian set up and then all of a sudden – 
they set up this inflatable fencing arena and so these guys are walking out in full fencing attire in like 30 degree sun beaming straight down into them and they're doing like this like knockout it was like you know you know if, if you've got a table tennis table in your office and it's like 1v1 but you've got 10 people who want to play and it's like all right if you lose then you're off there was like this bonus round of fencing where where everyone was lining up and if you get stabbed with the with the sword then you know you're off and the next person's on and you know it was a chance for these athletes to win bonus points i had no idea what was going on but it was pretty cool on on a contraption that looks like a you know an inflatable pool toy i know for those people in melbourne who have been to msac and know the um so melbourne sports and aquatic center they have this like inflatable obstacle course where you got to like jump through hoops and over obstacles and eventually get to the end. It's like if you're a 10 year old kid, it's the most fun thing in the world. Basically, these modern pentathletes were competing on a blow up obstacle course. That's what it looks like. <laughs> and then once the fencing bonus round was done, they went to the end of the, the vicinity where the Paris Olympic Committee had built a 25 meter lap pool for them to compete in a 200 meter swim. And I was like, what the hell is this? We're at the Pal Palace of Versailles <laughs> and you've got one incredible venue where people were swimming and riding horses and then going on this inflatable thing to, to stab each other with a stick. Like it was just, it was a lot happening. But I basically had to go straight from there to get to the public marathon course to begin that, which um, again, I'll, I'll get to in a sec. But um, yeah, so seeing all these different events and seeing the fans and how they reacted to different sports where you could clearly see that some had more atmosphere than others and some had more people just trying to observe to understand what was going on and some had more French fans, which really was a good thing too, was um, was really, uh, yeah, a really cool thing which um, highlighted the, uh, the Olympic spirit. Another thing that did that as well was this concept of Olympic houses. Now, I'd never heard of this before, but there's probably about 30 or 40 countries that had a venue within Paris designated as their country's house. So, for example, there was USA House and you had Czech House and you had New Zealand House. And basically, like, they were used as – they were used for a variety of things. Some of them was invite only. So, you know, some of the countries would use it as like a hospitality space to invite dignitaries and, and host sponsors and all these other different things. Others, you know, you could pay entry for to um, come and observe all the different things that they had to showcase. Others were just like a like a, a communal bar for people of that country to come together and watch. For example, I think I paid 10 euros to go into Czech House and inside, you know, you've got a bar serving all this, these Czech drinks and inside is just a few dozen Czech people sitting around watching a big screen, watching a Czech competitor compete in fencing at the time. So just a chance for, uh, for people to get together. Uh, Canada House had a particularly really cool one too. So, But this was just like another sort of thing that the Olympics brought that I didn't expect that really just kind of highlighted the Olympic spirit, highlighted you know everyone get together, everyone watch these amazing athletes perform on the, uh, on the world stage. So for me, if I'm thinking about LA 2028 and getting the most out of that, one thing that I would probably do beforehand is I would go through and create a, a list of events that I want to see. So who are the gold medal hopefuls for my event? You know, when and where is the host country going to compete? Because the French people really brought the atmosphere. One event that I think just would have been amazing to be at for the sake of the atmosphere was the men's rugby sevens final, which France won. Because in that event, um, you've got a team sport-like atmosphere. You've got the excitement of rugby sevens. You've uh, you've got France competing, but most importantly, you've got roughly seventy thousand people in a stadium cheering for the same thing. So I think that environment probably would have been the best thing to to see. Then the other thing I would do is make sure I'm getting to finals. So making sure I'm there when the medals are awarded because that's when, you know, the pressure's really on. But that is also when you get to see a medal ceremony. And, you know, I went to 16 different sports, but I reckon I probably only saw two or three medal ceremonies. And um, one was for Jess Fox, which was just one of the most incredible things I've ever witnessed in my sporting life. And the other one was for the men's, uh, track cycling team. I think it was the, the Team Pursuit Australia one. 
And so I got to see that and I believe I saw another one, but I can't remember exactly what it was. But just sitting there watching your country's flag go up as a national anthem is being played was just one of the most special experiences I've, I've ever been a part of. And even when it wasn't Australia being hoisted up, like – again, as I referred to before, you're looking at these athletes who have dedicated their entire life to represent their country at an event that happens once every four years. And it was just so special to think, you know, this person has just achieved their dream. Their life is never going to be the same after this moment. And that really just filled me with a lot of admiration for the people on those steps and getting those medals and um, was a really special thing to be a part of. So I think if I'm planning future, you know, future trips to Olympics, doesn't matter what sport, but just make sure you can get to a medal ceremony. Okay, so that was number one. Number two thing that really shaped my Olympic experience was the impact of the host nation. And um, again, having been to Qatar and Russia and India for various world events and now experienced Paris, I really believe that the host nation can take your overall experience from, say, a five, six or seven to a ten, which is what Paris was. And the reasoning for that is because, number one, their fans bring the most atmosphere, bring the most intensity. Number two is everything else around the sport outside of the stadium provides a canvas for your experience. So depending on what else is going out there, um, you know, will create the opportunities for you. So, for example, like when I was at Qatar, the Socceroos matches, amazing. Like we had an incredible run of – games and the results were awesome and some of the best hearts of my life but when you step out into Doha and into Qatar uh, there really isn't that much going on <laughs> whereas like you compare it to Paris and there's just like monuments everywhere the, be- the buildings are beautiful everything's really well connected and so that really opened the door for the rest of you know your experience to be to be incredible so for, uh, but a couple of things in terms of you know what the host nation kind of did for my experience that made it an amazing amazing time was um uh i can recall being there on the first day so on the day of the opening ceremony it was like a ghost town it was genuinely like one of the most cool things that i've ever ever walked through it kind of felt like i was back in covid and um because like um like having talked to people from the ioc who were extremely nervous about what a river opening ceremony could lead to by way of security threat you know is someone going to stand on top of a building and and shoot someone who shoot an athlete on a on a boat because they're in open range just to kind of make a political point or whatever the security was through the roof so just about every street within half a kilometer of a major monument was shut down there were, uh, I think, reportedly 50,000 cops kind of flown in and, and floating around. And uh, it looked like a few of them really took advantage of the fact that the city was shut down and were, were literally just doing joy rides around the Arc de Triomphe, up the Champs Elysees, wherever they wanted to go, because they had full reign of this city. So that was a really cool thing to experience. Um, the other thing was just there was just signage everywhere. Like everything was just plastered with Paris 2024. Like it was really cool to kind of feel like you've walked into this you know brand new environment those were a few cool things that kind of um made a made the canvas of paris uh, a really enjoyable experience one thing that wasn't great though was uh it was actually really hard to watch australian events so for example like um my mate chapo and i we missed out on watching the incredible match between the matildas and Zambia I can't even remember who they played anymore I think it was Zambia but some African nation that they should have beaten and ended up being I think 6-5 and so <laughs> my mate Chapo and I we look up Australian bar to find somewhere to watch the Matildas and we go to this rooftop place we walk in and they we get to the front door and they say hey um, it's going to be 20 euro to entry and uh, you get a wristband when you walk in. What color wristband would you like? And we're like, what do you mean? What's a wristband for? And also, why do we have to pay to go in to just watch the TV? What, what's going on here? And they said like, oh, well, you know, if you're single, you can have a green wristband. If you are taken, you can have a red one. And if it's kind of complicated, you can have a, a yellow wristband. And Chapo and I just kind of looked at each other and we're like, have we just walked into a traffic light party? And there was like this bar called Cafe Oz is running a traffic light party on a Sunday night and here we are just trying to watch the Matildas. So we paid our 20 euros, got our wristband, walked in, tried to find the TV and they didn't have it on. We were like, what the hell's going on here? So then we tried to race back to the Airbnb and um, 
tried to get hold of a VPN so we could then download Nine Now to try and watch the game. And by the time we'd done all that, it was too late. The game was over. But that that was one thing that um, we realized we needed for these games. Being from Australia, if we wanted to watch Australian events, we needed Australian broadcast coverage. And so I then found out that everyone else I bumped into had basically already cottoned on to this earlier. But if you're going to go get a VPN, get your uh, host country's broadcasters app so you can stream it, so you can actually watch the events you want to watch. So that was one downside of, of being in the host nation, um, just trying to watch your, your own country's events. But then besides that, say for ex- like Paris has just got so much to offer. And so say for example, like you've, you've been at the events all day and you just want to go out at night or, or have a wander around. Um, Paris just made that an incredible thing to do. So there were so many nights where I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go and see the Olympic balloon hanging out at the front of the Louvre. And, you know, you walk down past these historic buildings, past Hotel de Ville, through the through the Louvre, past the pyramids, and then all of a sudden there's this amazing balloon hovering above the ground with the Olympic torch lit up within it. And you've got people all around you. And then once you're done, and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to ride home now. I jump on a line bike and riding along the, li- the river Seine and, uh, you know, you pass a Notre Dame building on the way home and you pass a Pantheon as well and, um, you know, you go to bed. The next morning you wake up and you're like, all right, you know, I've had way, much, way too many croissants and a bit too much to drink these far- past few weeks. I'm going to go for a run. Well, let's just go for a run around the Luxembourg Gardens and, you know, once I've run out of space then and we'll head out to the Eiffel Tower and back along the Seine and see the same monuments again. So it was just like like everywhere you look was – or dropping, you know, jaw dropping and or inspiring. <laughs> and uh, it just made every single minute of being in Paris like incredible. And the other cool thing about that too was that there were there were not too many tourists to try and compete with. Um, there's an interesting argument. Um, someone might probably want to correct me for this because um, I've only done a surface level of research into this. But I heard someone talk about an argument being made around the economic impact of the Olympics and how – if you are bringing the games to another city, typically the games just brings in a massive amount of money with the amount of sponsorship and tourism and everything that comes with it. But with Paris, it doesn't need the Olympic Games to attract you know thousands and thousands, literally millions of tourists. I remember a, a tour guide on a on a bike tour that I did in 2015 told me that in the month of July or August, one in eight people in Paris is a local; the other are all tourists. And so with these Olympic Games, all the normal tourists who want to come and see the Eiffel Tower, who want to go to the Louvre and see the Mona Lisa, it felt like they weren't here because the Olympic Games were on. But you had a whole lot of sports tourists there instead. And what that did is it made the city feel quieter than a usual Parisian summer, which for us sporting tourists was was actually a really, really nice thing because things weren't overly crowded and everyone was there for the same purpose in a really good mood. So that was one of the awesome things about it. It, it attracted a very specific crowd and you know pushed away some of the crowds that you usually get in Paris too. But when I think about going to major events, a couple of things that I will judge it on are ticketing, transport, atmosphere at events and just atmosphere around town too. So for example... Um, I, I, the, the ticketing at Paris 2024 was the easiest I've ever come across. When I went to the Russia 2018 World Cup, and, and I believe this was happening at Qatar as well, we had to create something that was called our FIFA ID. It was basically like a brand new passport. So we had to have this like extra level of documentation just to buy a ticket. And then if we wanted to transfer it to somebody else, we had to like go through some big application process. And then... At the Cricket World Cup in India last year, there were no paperless tickets. And if it wasn't for an old boss of mine at the ICC who was able to help me out and and just say, hey, Ruben, go to this hotel and ask the desk and you'll you'll have your tickets, you know, I would have been standing in line for for hours to get my tickets with everyone else. And, um, And it just seemed like a bit of unnecessary chaos. Whereas in Paris, it was some of the, it was as easy as it could have possibly been. Buying tickets for the first time was amazing. Getting resale tickets was really easy too. If you wanted to sell your tickets back, that was pretty simple. If you had a ticket for a friend and you wanted to transfer it to them, it was literally like copy this link and send it to them and and it's done in a heartbeat. So 
ticketing is something that can just be such a headache for for, for people and I think Paris absolutely nailed it. So I hope other events around the world, you know, jump onto that immediately. Uh, the other one is transport. So getting around to the games, uh, getting home from the games is is super important too. I have been to many a football, so, you know, international football, international soccer game at Stadium Australia in Sydney and I know that getting home from there is one of the worst experiences you can ever have. <laughs> and um, I feel for those people who went to the semifinal for the Women's World Cup last year who were stranded out there for, for about three hours because the train wasn't working. And even like, you know, I went to a Formula One event in Abu Dhabi and trying to get home from there when they've only got taxis and you've got to wait in a taxi line for two hours, which is absolutely hell. And even um, at the FIFA World Cup in, in Qatar, even though they spent $200 billion to get the city up to scratch and build all the infrastructure and build a brand new metro system as well. Like we were still getting home at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning every single night just because you'd have to like, just to get out to where accommodation was available in Qatar, you had to like catch a train and then you had to get a connecting bus. Whereas Paris already had all of that there. So it was just super, super simple and easy um, and really made a difference to the experience of people who were there. And then the other thing was the atmosphere at events. So as I mentioned before, there's probably not too many events at the Olympics that I would go and see individually if they weren't involved in the Olympics. And so that kind of changes the, um, the atmosphere of some of them. But for things like the 100-meter final, I had never felt more nervous for an event that I, I was not involved in in my entire life than sitting there watching these guys come out, take the blocks. There was about like a, a minute-long wait before the – the race started and then off they go and you realize like oh my god that's the uh, that's a 100 meter final of the uh, of the olympics and so that was really really cool to be at but then yeah if you could get along to the host nation that was w- where the atmosphere really lay but then compared to like but that that was also something that was really consistent with um say the fifa world cup because you know i go to australia versus france in russia and ironically we played them in qatar as well and there's maybe about fifteen to 20,000 people in that stadium who actually care about the result. And so, and the rest is just filled with random people who want to get to the event. And so even though you feel like the intensity of the match, the atmosphere doesn't necessarily always match because you don't have this echoing volume of noise that comes from every direction that you might get from, say, 90,000 people at the MCG or from two football AFL sides who are heavily invested. So I remember like, I remember being at Australia versus Denmark in the Qatar World Cup and Matt Leckie scores his goal to send us through the round of 16. And we're going nuts in our little box, but, you know, the noise just didn't really match it. But then I watch highlights back from Fed Square where there's about 30,000 people in Melbourne dancing and carrying along and there's flares going off in the middle of the night. And I kind of looked at that and I was like, you know what, that atmosphere kind of looks like it would be better than being here in the stadium right now. But... You know, obviously you want to see the real thing in, in real life. But that sort of atmosphere is what you get when you come to these international events where it is hard for fans to to get to. So to summarize all this and how, how does it compare to other events, like in terms of atmosphere, like you don't go to the Olympics, I think, for the atmosphere. I think the atmosphere around town is really where the benefit sits. The atmosphere for all the host nation is is amazing, but you're there for for the rest of the vibe, in in my opinion. But um, one little thing with the with the marathon that was quite cool for me when I was doing the uh, the test to see how long I could stick with these lead this lead pack. For those who have seen the video, you will see that after about a minute of running alongside them, I get absolutely surprised when a hat just appears right in front of me. And what had happened was a runner from the USA had taken his hat off and thrown it into the crowd and literally like landed right in my lap. And so I kind of caught it and kept running. It was like, it was a miracle that I held on to it, to be honest. And um, once I stopped running, I had a look at the hat, saw the USA flag on it. And then underneath the brim was the signature of, of one of the runners. And I was like, who is this person who has pre-signed their hat and thrown it to me in the crowd? And very luckily after the marathon had ra- wrapped up, and by the way, so this is when they're going out heading out on the course so they head out to Versailles turn around come back to complete the second half and um you know I got my content in for the first half when they're running out and um on the way back they run directly underneath the Eiffel Tower and I thought I'm going to run along with them again here and so this time I kind of just put my phone away and just thought let's just look at whoever's leading and see how we go 
And it was honestly one of the most special moments of my life. Like when uh, the lead runner came through for the first time and I just started running alongside him and it was just me and this bloke from Ethiopia just just having a jog in Paris and the Eiffel Tower's behind us overlooking us and, you know, you just it was just an incredible feeling with all the noise of the crowd. I tried to think, oh, yeah, the crowd's cheering for me here too. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just running with the lead run of the marathon and, um, you know, eventually he burnt me out and off, and off he went. But it was just a very cool experience to be able to um, get to do that. But then after that, I was wandering along. One of the things you have to do in Paris to find good coffee, if you are a coffee snob like I am, or if you're just from Melbourne in general, is uh, if you want something that is going to meet your needs, you need to search specialty coffee. So I punch in specialty coffee into Google Maps and find this cafe. And sure enough, there are other Australians there. <laughs> and uh, I was wearing <laughs> I was wearing this Australian athletics singlet, which was given to me back in 2017 by um, the uh, Athletics Australia people who were at the uni sport, uh, who were at the World Uni Games that I was doing my internship at. And the reason I got this singlet was because there was an officials race and I entered it. Um, I actually won the race because I was the youngest there by about 20 years. But I was representing Australia on the world stage. So the athletics team gave me this singlet to, to run it and then and I got to hold on to it. So I'm still wearing this out, running alongside the Ethiopians. Um, but then I get to this cafe and I bump into someone who is a legitimate representative of Australia. And that was Izzy Doyle Bat, who competed in the 5,000 meters. And we kind of look at if we look at each other, and I feel like an absolute imposter because I'm wearing the Australian kit without actually representing Australia. And she's there in full Australian uniform. And um, anyway, I go over and chat, and turns out she was actually in in Taipei as well for those games too. And, and one of the really cool things about being in Paris was actually seeing a lot of the athletes from Taipei now competing on the world stage of the biggest multi sport event in the world. The uni, the World Uni Games, is the second largest multi-sport event in the world, and and back then you had uh, you had people like Michelle Jenica in the hurdles who was um, coming through. You had basketballers like um, Kirsty Wallace of the Opals or Xavier Cooks for the for the Boomers coming through, and a bunch of other different people. Um, uh, Nicola McDermott, um, I remember chatting to her walking into the opening ceremony for the World Uni Games, and now she's winning silver medals in the high jump in in Paris and Tokyo, mind you. And so to be able to see all these people who you, you know, who I personally had done my internship with and see them on this pathway and to now perform in the world stage was such a, was such a cool experience for myself. But Izzy was able to help me identify the signature of this hat. And sure enough, it was Connor Mance from the, from the Team USA who I think finished eighth or ninth. And so um, now I've got this like little souvenir from the, from the marathon event, which is the hat of one of the competitors. But... One of the other things that really added to it as well in terms of, you know, what, what does a host nation do to make the event better than it could be anywhere else in the world? Paris had this idea or brand campaign to make it games wide open. And so that meant making the events as accessible or making the Olympics as accessible to as many people as possible. So, for example, some of the initiatives for that included, um, you know, having the opening ceremony come down the River Seine so that anybody could watch it. Or turning the whole Trocadero, pre, I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong, the Trocadero precinct turned into Champions Park underneath the Eiffel Tower so that you could come and celebrate the people who have, who have um, won a medal that day. You know, even the day that I was out of the canoe slalom and Jess Fox wins this amazing gold medal, they then take her over to like the athlete zone where fans can come right up to the fence and um and celebrate with Jess and so if you wanted to you could literally reach out and grab a selfie with her or give her a hug or whatever like I was lit- literally standing a meter away from Jess Fox who's become like Australia's newest sporting legend who's in the middle of soaking up this gold medal um and you know turning to an Aussie icon and um and just to be able to share it with the athletes was was really really cool but then one of the other initiatives which I, I had to get involved in was the running of the public marathon so I didn't know about this when I arrived. <laughs> but when I arrived in Paris, um, somebody told me that on the evening of the men's marathon, they were going to open up the marathon course for the public to compete in. And I thought, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I cannot miss out on. 
the chance to run the Paris Olympics marathon course. And so it was going to start at 9 p.m. And I thought 9 p.m. start, you know, if it takes me four hours, I'm going to be done by 1 a.m. That's just a bizarre concept, but I'm here for it. And uh, I didn't know how to get involved. So I just rocked up and um, got to the start line. I'd done no training. I'd done no preparation, but I just wanted to get involved. <laughs> and so I, at 9 p.m. on the final Saturday of competition, I, I ran 42.2 kilometers through Paris <laughs> and it absolutely broke me. <laughs> so, but before it broke me, it was one of the most <laughs> incredible experiences ever because the start just felt like, an absolute party. They had music going off. They had lights. I reckon there was more people on the street for the public marathon than the actual professional marathon because we're, we're running along the streets. The whole thing's gated. Like you're high-fiving people for kilometers on end. When you get to a, a particularly amazing spot like out the front of the Louvre, you've got fans there. And I say fans because they are fans of us running. Um, you know, 50 people deep cheering and, and clapping on and it was just all it was just an incredible incredible atmosphere and then you know you, you're running through the louvre you run past the olympic balloon you you go past all the monuments it's kind of sunset so it's like twilight like paris just looks beautiful at this point in time and then after about eight kilometers or so you know you're running past the eiffel tower and i don't know if they the organizers like timed it so that we would run past when the eiffel tower was doing its little sparkle thing but it was a real pinch me moment, moment to be running along the River Seine with the Eiffel Tower sparkling in the background. I'm like, is this real life right now? I'm running the Olympics marathon course with the Eiffel Tower going off with, you know, 40,000 of my closest friends here. How good is this? But then that's when I probably should have got off the course <laughs> because after that, that's when I realized actually I have to do a marathon here. <laughs> and, um, and like I like I can do a half marathon, no problem. But my previous nine weeks had been spent in Bali and London in Paris and I had no intention of keeping up my aerobic fitness. Um, I had every intention of enjoying myself as much as possible. <laughs> and so I was probably carrying a couple of extra kegs. Uh, I definitely was, you know, my aerobic capacity probably dropped a bit. And so I got to about the 22-kilometer mark and that's when like the hills of this course kicked in and uh, I started to break down. And um, if you listen to the actual professionals talk about this race, you know, they described it as one of the most brutal marathon courses in, in history. And it wasn't just the uphill, it was the downhill as well. Trying to brace your knees to, to make sure you don't fall over was painful too. And so um, I got out to Versailles where I'd literally just left that day from the modern pentathlon. And I was like, oh my God, I've got to make it all the way back into Paris here to try and complete this marathon and so like <laughs> I reckon I started walking by about the 25 kilometer mark and I was like my god I've still got 17 kilometers to get through and, I, and I'm walking here and like I yeah I I try I don't ever walk <laughs> if I if I'm running a half marathon or going for a run like I, I don't walk um and so this was new territory for me uh I sound like a real elitist saying that but it was actually really helpful having crowds out in Versailles because I was too embarrassed <laughs> to uh, to keep walking in front of them. And so they really kept pushing me to the point where I was like, okay, there's no one around here. I'm, now I'll, I'll, you know, indulge myself and, and walk for a little bit. But um, eventually made it back into Paris, made it back under the Eiffel Tower. And again, like it was just another pinch me moment where you're like, what the hell am I doing here? It's, it's literally 1 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday night and I'm running under the Eiffel Tower and there's people here and it's like, what's going on? Like, when am I ever going to get the chance to do this again? It was just such a surreal event to do. And so at the end of the race, like, I realized I'd been plodding along for too long and uh, made sure I ran the last two kilometers. And so when I actually decided to kick the heels up a bit and run in my full stride, it actually felt a lot better. It took the pressure off my knees and my ankles a fair bit and, and it was a lot more comfortable. So I finished it um, in fast fashion. So I was high-fiving people on the way back in, got my medal and then just like collapsed on the ground. And then I think by the time I got home, it was about 3 a.m. and my body was just like broken. But the fact that you even get to do that was amazing. And so I'm just so grateful to the Paris Olympic Committee and to whoever came up with this games wide open idea because – it meant that fans could have this experience that we've never been able to have before in the history of the Olympics. So to anyone who is working on LA 2028, please keep that around because it was phenomenal. 
um, and something I'll carry with me for the for the rest of my life. But I guess just to, just to round out this sort of you know point of the host make the host nation really can make the whole difference to your experience. I guess the action I'm taking is just get to more of these events because um, you know the last couple of men's FIFA World Cups, like you know. Qatar and Russia, probably not the most appealing in the history of all host nations. Apologies if you are from either of those nations. But, you know, coming up, you've got the LA Games. LA will do a phenomenal job. The next Men's FIFA World Cup is also happening in USA, Canada and Mexico. All those places I think will do a phenomenal job too. The next Winter Olympics in 2026 is happening in Italy, in Cortino, I believe, just outside of Milan. And, um, you know, people are saying that will be one of the most spectacular events ever too and i think you know having seen what france has done i think italy can can match that just in a different season and so you know i couldn't even tell you what events are going to happen at the winter olympics but knowing what's a place like that could do to an event i'm like i have to be there for that and then equally the women's fifa world cup is going to brazil in 2027 and i think that would just be such a phenomenal thing to to be a part of and so it just knowing what a host nation can do to elevate the experience of these events and knowing the caliber of countries that are hosting the next set of major events in the world, particularly between Olympics and, and football world cups has just got me so excited to, to get to the next one. And then finally point number three of what made all the difference to my Olympic experience was the people, the people made all the difference to my Olympic experience. And that is because these people will open up opportunities that you have no idea existed when you get to go to these events or you just go out to dinner together, you create shared memories together, which are, which are just awesome to experience. And they, then they lead to a thing known as greater memory dividends. And this is a concept coined by a guy called Bill Perkins. He wrote a book called Die With Zero. And one of the things he talks about is, you know, invest in experiences and memories because when you put money in, into an experience, you don't just get back what you experience in that moment. Every time you get to talk about it in the future, you get a little memory dividend and it, you know, it gets, gives you another little hit of dopamine where you get to talk about that awesome thing that you did and it just makes you feel good again time and time and time again. And so the memory dividend that I'm going to get of talking about doing this Paris Marathon for the rest of my life is just going to be you know, extraordinary and will you know, we'll absolutely cover any sort of cost that it took me to get here. And so when you can share those mem memory dividends with other people, it just, you know, it makes it a whole lot better. It gives you more chances to talk about it, to laugh about it. Um, and so the people really made all the difference. And so, for example, like the – here's a few of the people that kind of shaped my experience. For example, like – one of the people who made it, this whole thing possible was my my housemate for a couple of weeks, which was uh, Penelope. Penelope is a sports grad pro member, and um, and when I was thinking about you know accommodation in Paris and how hard it was going to get and how hard it was going to be to get and how costly it was going to be, I reached out to Pen, who's you know an Australian living in Paris, and uh, and she very kindly said, "Yeah, you can just you can just stay in my spare room. My housemate's going away. Just crash with me." Which, um, which made it awesome. Um, and that meant I got to meet her friend, uh, Bryony, who was working on the golf that week. And then, um, and then through this group chat as well, you know, got to catch up with, with Ed and then, you know, leaving the, uh, leaving the canoe slalom, bump into fellow sports grad member, Catherine Jeffcock. And so then she says, what are you doing for dinner tonight? And I go out with her sister and all her friends and meet a whole bunch of different there. And then this group chat just kind of led to, experience after experience so there was one particular night where we had a group chat drinks where you know i rocked up and i met taylor and lana for the first time who are friends of friends who have you know two of the people who randomly caught hold of this group chat and i'm meeting them for the first time and then all of a sudden you know dobbo and steve i rock up and then garth arrives and then lizzie and bridget walk in and all of a sudden you know you just got this group of australians at this random bar who are all meeting each other for the first time and everyone's like what the hell what's going on here <laughs> so um that was a really cool thing to to do, and then you know, next thing you know, you're you're bumping into the uh, the CEO of a um, of a national sporting organisation at two a.m. in the morning, who just happens to be walking past, um, who uh, who who amazingly knew about sports grad. That was kind of that was a cool thing to to hear too. But then you know, even like just being able to um, share different events with people too. So Josh Groudon from the Kicking Consultant, or who is the Kicking Consultant, who's been on the podcast. 
uh, back in episode 250, I think, or two, you know, 240, 246 maybe I think he was, you know, being able to go to the 100-meter final with him and share that with him is something we'll always be able to share together. But then the Olympics is just such like a, a hub for everyone to pass through for a different periods of time. And um, it gave me and two of my friends the chance to have a reunion eight years in the making. So these two particular friends, they're called Kiri and Naomi. And I met them during my uni sport internship that took me to a conference in France in, uh, in 2016. And um, at this conference, you know, were all these different student delegates from all over the world. And uh, Kiri from the UK, Naomi from New Zealand and me from Australia all got along quite well. But we, we had never been able to get together ever since. And so Paris kind of provided the opportunity to do that. And so eight years down the track, we gathered on this um, rooftop bar in Montmartre overlooking Paris and uh, got to share, you know, dinner and drinks together, which was just wonderful. But it also kind of opened my eyes to the fact that the Olympics provides a reunion to those people who work on the games uh, seemingly every two or every four years, depending on um, how many you get to. And so um, I was hanging out with Basha from the group chat one night. So Barbara Sikorsky, who's, uh, who's been on the podcast, works at Sail GP, came and was one of, a speaker at our Sydney events at the start of, start of the year. And Barbara is Polish and she's got some friends at the Olympics. And so she said, why don't you come along to Poland House? So I went along to that and, uh, and then eventually she said, oh, actually, I've got some more friends at Canada House. Why don't you come to that? So we go to Canada House. And I get to Canada House and Barbara's like introducing me to some of her friends who have worked at previous Olympic Games and it kind of occurred to me that, okay, this is just like a, a reunion for everyone who's worked on the previous, you know, Rio or London or whatever. And I'm looking around the room just kind of scanning, being like, this is such a cool spot to be in. And all of a sudden, standing right in front of me is none other than Chaim Katrib, the uh, former head of workforce of the FIFA Women's World Cup and podcast guest from episode 132, I think it was. And um, Chaim, again with Basha, was a panelist at our Sydney event. And I haven't been in too much in touch with her since that. It was probably like two years ago now. And then all of a sudden, I'm at a random venue in Paris and Chaim just appears in front of me. And I was like, what are you doing here? And she's like, what are you doing here? And um, and so then, sh so if you've listened to Chaim's interview, you'll know that she was a former primary school teacher who got involved with events, who then got introduced to the Sydney Olympic Committee and then and then she goes and does Athens and Salt Lake and, and the rest of it. She's done about eight or nine different Olympics. And so now she's back as like a consultant working on, on Paris. And uh, so she introduced, introduces me to, to her friends who she's worked on like several different Olympics with. And I was just like, I was really admiring her and her group of friends thinking like, isn't this awesome? These guys have worked in the same event time and time again. These guys have got sh so many shared memories, so many shared experiences together that like it made me wanted to get back involved in a tournament again. And, you know, for me that tour tournament time sort of experience and shared memories come from the, the T20 World Cup. And so I've got a lot of friends who went through that together and you know, I was working with a team and slightly separate to it. And so but those people who are a core part of the organising committee will know how special putting on that event together is and everything that you get to do behind the scenes that comes with being a part of it. And a lot of those people, you know, go on to do the next Cricket World Cup and the one after that and the one after that. And eventually, you, you know, you're on this circus that goes around the world, go from cricket event to a cricket event or, you know, you're on the FIFA circuit or you're on the Olympic circuit. Like there's so many different tournament circuits out there that if you can get on one of them and you do one after the other after the other, you just have this like, compounding experience and these compounding relationships where you work another one with another person and again like the the memories and the people and the relationships that come from that are really really special so I, I spent the entire night just kind of looking at Chaim and her friends being like you guys have spent you know the better part of you know 20 to 30 years working together on Olympic events what an amazing thing you guys can can talk about together so the the people made all the difference in my eyes and even you know just like bumping into random people like Nat Cook. Nat Cook has been on the, the podcast in the past. For those who don't know who Nat Cook is, she is a five-time Australian uh, Olympian in the beach volleyball, gold medalist as well. And so when I'm out at the canoe slalom and Jess Fox wins her gold medal and I'm leaving the venue, 
all of a sudden Nat Cook rocks up and we're just going, how good was that together? And I'm like to be able to share that experience with her and talk about what it meant uh, and to particularly able to do that with another gold medalist as well, you know, not me, the gold medalist, but like with a person who understands what it takes to win a gold medal was just like a really cool thing to do too. So, but again, like that only comes from, for me personally, like doing this podcast and being heavily involved in the sports industry and knowing lots of people, the networking um, that was done sort of prior to the Olympics that led to the connections and the random interactions and bump ins during the games kind of made a lot of the, a lot of the difference too. But then again, like, there was also like the there was also a people element that was a wonderful thing when there were nights where I was just on my own. So for example, like there was one particular night where I left the track cycling at about nine thirty and was on the train going back home and you know had put in the group chat who's around tonight. No one was around. And I was like, okay, this might just be a chance to catch up on some on some sleep. And uh, instead, I decided to jump out of the train when it got past the Eiffel Tower and just walk around. And so I walked down the street and sure enough, you know, there's the, uh, the Cuban wrestler who's getting uh, photos in the street after he's just won his gold medal. I'm walking past restaurants that are filled with, uh, with lanyard people. I, I started calling anyone who had a lanyard on, a lanyard person. And you just got like, you know, like teams of, of countries in these restaurants. Eventually I just sat down at one and um, – I was there for the next 90 minutes but not for a single second was I alone because on the table to my left were two brothers from the USA who were on a family holiday. We started talking about what events they've been to and what they're here for and you know some of their highlights and then on the table to my right were a French family and they wanted to know all about what it was like in Australia and so that's kind of like what the Olympics created, just this willingness for everyone to want to connect and want to talk to each other. So even if you were alone, at no point were you actually alone because everyone – was so keen to to mingle. And after I'd had dinner, started, you know, jumped on a line bike, headed back home towards Notre Dame. And um, on a previous trip to Paris, I'd been to this like cave-like jazz club. And I thought, I might just pop my head in here. I don't mind a bit of jazz. Played a bit of trumpet back in the day. And, uh, and so I thought, let's just pop my head in here and see what's happening tonight. And I walk into this jazz club, go downstairs, and sure enough, there is Cody Simpson dancing with randoms in the middle of this jazz club. And um, <laughs> and um, I was like, what have I stumbled upon here? If you don't know who Cody Simpson is, go and look him up. Athlete, pop star, can do it all, handsome, just like the ultimate human. But then eventually just by standing around and kind of just very contently standing at the back of the room, just taking it all and taking it all in, being like, yeah, I'm just I'm just having a quiet beer at a jazz club, just observing. And someone came up to me and said like, you know, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, I'm just – you know, just in just enjoying Paris and um, got chatting with them again. Maybe it's the willingness of the Olympics. Maybe it's a bit of alcohol. I don't know, but got chatting with these people who eventually said, Hey, we're going to leave here and go to this other nightclub. We've got a bunch of free passes. Do you want to come with us? And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? And so I eventually end up at this nightclub near, uh, near the Arc de Triomphe and I go in, head downstairs and it's absolutely full. And just about every person is a lanyard person. And it was the second week of the Olympics. Most of the events are done. And so what I realized I'd stumbled upon on a random Wednesday night is just all these athletes <laughs> enjoying themselves in the back end of the games. And so everyone was kind of like wearing their team uniform, dressed up in some way, shape or form. And so, you know, you go up to a random bloke who's like six foot 10 and you'd be like, you know, who are you? What do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm in the German rowing team. And there were just like literally hundreds of people like that. Some people had their medals and I was like, this is amazing. And so that kind of just came from a random solo night out where I was like, I'm not going to go home. I'm just going to see what Paris has to offer me. And sure enough, that's what came from it. But then again, like similarly, like, you know, staying with uh, Penelope introduced me to her friends um, and gave us a, an incredible experience on the night of the opening ceremony. So it was pissing down with rain that night. Instead of going to watch from the River Seine, we went to a watch party that was being hosted by one of her friends. And um, seeing like Celine Dion at the end of the night was a real highlight, just being like she's singing on the Eiffel Tower. I'm in Paris. This is happening around me. It kind of signified like what well, literally signifies the start of the Olympic Games, but it kind of really hit home. I'm in Paris we're here for the Olympics. Let's go. This is awesome. And you know, we end up 
having a party with these random people who have just met just through Penelope's friends. And the theme of that night was come dress as an Olympic sport. And so I had some cricket whites in my bag. So I'm wearing these white pants. And then I had my Athletics Australia singlet. So I put that on over the top. And together they kind of make me look like a gymnast. <laughs> it's kind of like a gymnast outfit. And um, so after the opening ceremony is done, we go out to a bar and and um, I'm still dressed up in my ridiculous uniform. But there was a French guy who, <laughs> who was like so confused that an athlete would head out after the opening ceremony, given that they had the biggest competition of their life coming up in the days afterwards. And um, I thought this would just be a bit of fun and just kind of went with it. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, nah, it's, it's okay. Like my coach says I can have a couple of drinks and then um, you know, I'll be competing later this week. I'll be fine. And they had the opening ceremony played on a TV in the background. And so really just to kind of ramp up the ridiculousness of it, I like got up on a chair and was like pointing at the Australian boat as it came past. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm in there. I'm in there. And everyone's like, woo, yeah, there's Olympian like here tonight. And I'm like, this is just stupid. But surely like half the people realize this, you know, this guy's not an Olympian. But this one dude was convinced that I was. So I just kind of went along with it. But again, like, you know, you don't, you know that fun night out with these random people I'm meeting for the first time and that ends up with a ridiculous story trying to convince these people that I'm actually any good at sport doesn't happen unless you know I've got that initial connection to Penelope who very generously has um you know changed the course of my Olympic experience by um letting me stay with her so to kind of round out this third point of you know what really shaped my Olympic experience and you know it's the people things that I would do before LA 2028 or any other major event is number one, I'll make sure I'm there for the whole thing. Make sure I'm open myself up to as much opportunity, as many experiences as possible. Second thing I would do is I would put a lot of time in beforehand to meet people who might want to, might want to go to the games as well or might want to go to this particular event because had I not known these people who I could literally invite to the group chat, then, you know, there wouldn't even be a group chat, you know, I couldn't get to Paris and start the group chat once I'm there. Like it had to be done beforehand. And so uh, it was, again, it was another great reminder just to keep being interested in people and keep meeting people doing lots of different things because you never know where they might end up. Some of them might end up in Paris one day. Some of them might end up at LA 2028 or another different events. Um, and that really led to a lot of the highlights that I had there. It was came from a lot of time spent well before the Olympics even happened to just, you know, literally meet these people and form a relationship with them. And then the third thing that I would do is, you know, continue to be the person who brings them together because that really, um, you know, putting out a message in the group chat saying, hey, who's around for this? Who's around for that? Um, led to those opportunities that created those memories. So those are the three things I'll be telling myself to do next time. Now, I know I've spoken for a while and there's a lot to kind of digest in, in all that. But one thing that I always do at the end of a trip, no matter if it's sporting related or with family, friends, whatever, is a VH, a VL and an SM. And this, uh, this concept was introduced to me by my friend Aiden. He's a very thoughtful guy. He always makes sure that we're reflecting and enjoying life and in the present moment. And um, when we went on a trip to, to uh, Thailand in, when we were 21, on the final dinner, he said, all right, I want everyone to think about what is their VH, so their very high moment, their VL, the very low moment, and their SM, their sparkle moment, something that just made you smile. And so this is mine. My VH, I mean, and I couldn't keep it to one. I'm sorry. There's just so much that happened. My VH was uh, one, being there for Jess Fox's gold medal. That was honestly one of the most special things I've, I've ever witnessed in my life um, and it was just so happy to kind of see this legend representing Australia uh, dominate on the world stage and uh, achieve something in incredible. Second one was the 100 meter final. That and you know knowing the um, prestige around that event and the history of that event um, and it really being the sort of you know the uh, the crown jewel of the Olympic events being there in person and experiencing the build up and it, and and the actual race itself end up being the closest men's 100 meter final in the history of the Olympics was um was my second VH <laughs> and then the third one was literally like the two or three dozen people that I met along the way like every single time I got to meet a new person we would go out or have a coffee or whatever it was just so special being able to share the Olympics with with so many different people so 
I'm sorry I couldn't keep it a one, but those are my VHs. Uh, my VL, I actually really had to think about this and literally nothing went wrong. <laughs> like it was, I was tired a lot of the time because I was going out so much um, and trying to squeeze the most out of every single day. But really it was a pretty flawless trip. I guess the only thing, like yesterday I'm back in Melbourne, I go and see my barista for the first time again and he said, um, did anything get stolen? And I was like, no, nah, nothing got stolen while I, while I was away, but I had stuff get stolen <laughs> back in Melbourne while I was away. So like I, all of my stuff is currently sitting in a storage unit at the moment and I got an email one day saying, hey, Ruben, sorry to say, but um, our, the entire storage precinct has been broken into and your lock has been cut off and, you know, here's a photo of your storage unit. Can you just check, you know, if anything looks looks different? So that was probably my VL just like getting that message. But, um, you know, thankfully my lock is just full of junk. It's just all random clothes and, and old artifacts. So not too much damage there. And then SM, my sparkle moment. So the first one, again, I got two. First sparkle moment was watching the opening ceremony and specifically just like leaning against a wall at this watch party, listening to Celine Dion, seeing the final song um, of the event and watching the pictures of Paris and just having her kind of signify the games are, the games are open. And for me, that was super special because I, for me, I was thinking about this is like arguably the biggest and most special event in the world. I'm in Paris for all of it. I'm just so excited for what I'm about to experience. But also as kind of a acknowledgement of like, you know, wh- one of the things I want to be able to do with my life is, you know, run sports ground in a way that allows me to say yes to opportunities and events and be there for the big moments. And it was a really kind of nice reminder that like, Ruben, you've created a life for yourself that's allowed you to be in Paris for the full three weeks and allowed you to be here for the big moments. And so being able to sit there and listen to Celine and feel like I'm in for the absolute trip of a lifetime here was a really special moment that made me smile a lot. The second sparkle moment was the first kilometer of the marathon. <laughs> um, and if you haven't done a mass, particip- mass participation event before, I would highly encourage you to do one. Because the amount of people just clapping us along as we commence this Paris Marathon course was really, really, really special. Um, so many people just showed up with signs and banners and just like, you know, random snakes, uh, lollies, like just things to keep us going. Like, like there was so much public support. You know, you really felt it and it was it was just such a lovely community event and then the fact that it was in Paris and the Olympics really just added to that. So that was something that really uh, made me smile. So... That was my Paris Olympic experience. I've talked for a lot longer than I thought I would. <laughs> if you're still listening, thank you for, for continuing to tune in. Would I go again? Absolutely. I don't want to miss another Olympic Games after this. This was honestly one of the highlights of my entire life. Would I go again with an open plan? Uh, I'd probably do a bit more preparation to make sure that I get around to all the different things I want to see. For example, I would have loved to see some more of the Olympic houses, but I didn't know that they were going to be there. But again, it, it really just was a nice reminder just to be, you know, make sure you are there for the big moments. And that, that is something that I've kind of specifically told myself from previous annual reflections that I've done of, you know, 2023, 2022, what were the things that really were the standout experiences of my life in those years? And it was always these major events. And so I kind of made a little rule for myself, Ruben, make sure you are there for the big moments, whether that's a wedding or a, you know, friend's wedding, family birthday, major sporting event, make sure that you are there for the big moments. And then the last thing I guess, you know, that I kind of took away and to conclude all this is just keep meeting people, keep bringing people together, keep pushing yourself to kind of step outside and see what happens. Even if you've got no plans, you've got no idea where this could happen. Like the Olympics was just such an amazing environment to be able to step outside and just, and just see what the world has to offer. Even when you have no idea where this could go and you have no plans, that was um, one of the best things about it. So yeah, that was my Olympics. Thank you for, for listening in. If you followed any of my contents on LinkedIn or Instagram during that time, um, I really appreciate it. I got a lot of people who are sending me messages along the way saying that they were really enjoying seeing what it was like. Hopefully this jet lag dribble of my experience made some sense and I hopefully encourage you to go and experience a major event in the future. It doesn't have to be the Olympics. Maybe it's you know, something else of your liking. But the fact that this is kind of just the greatest conference on earth that brings people together 
has really got me excited to, to do it again. So I'm going to stop talking. Otherwise, um, we'll go on for hours, but can't wait for the next one. And if I met you along the way, thank you for making it such an awesome experience. Cheers. Hey friends, one last thing before you go. If you really want to make an impact in sport, then subscribe to the Sports Grad newsletter. Inside, we share all the latest job openings and networking events, so you're always aware of opportunities to land a job and grow your network. Plus, we share a Q&A with a professional on how they grow their career in sport. Here we talk about things like how they moved overseas or negotiated their salary or landed a new job or promotion, made a career change and so much more. It's kind of like a little boost of inspiration in your inbox before the weekend. So if you're like us, you're career driven and you're keen to progress quickly, you're going to love the Sportsgrad newsletter. To get it, head to sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe or follow the link in the show notes. See you next time.